What's up, everybody? Welcome to the 4040 Vision Podcast. I am your host, Khaled Abdallah, and I'm joined today by my fellow host, Salman Huck. What's up, brother? How you doing? Yo, what's going on, man? Not much, not much. Ready to dive into the 2011 NBA Draft. So in today's topic, we're going to be redrafting the top 14 picks, a.k.a. the lottery of the 2011 draft. And the reason we're doing that is because the top pick in this draft, Kyrie Irving, is heading back to the NBA Finals. We're recording this on June 5th, so he'll be uh, making his finals debut with the Mavericks in just a couple of days, and they'll be hoping to take down the Boston Celtics. So we figured, let's see if Kyrie goes number one in his own draft, uh, given some of the uh, recent changes in his career path. So the format is going to be simple. I'll be announcing each uh, original pick, which team they went to, what college they went to, all that. And then Salman and I will take turns making our pick, basically who we would have taken instead, or if we would have stood pat with uh, the original selection here. So we'll jump into the first overall pick, which, as I mentioned already, was Kyrie Irving uh, to the Cleveland Cavaliers. He plays about eight games at Duke the year before due to injury, which is kind of a spoiler for uh, much of his career. And he ends up going first overall to the LeBron list. Cleveland Cavaliers. So, Solman, who did you have going number one overall in this draft? I did not stay with Kyrie Irving. I went with Kawhi Leonard. Um, I mean, even though Kawhi Leonard is in the recent past has uh, some injury issues, he's, I mean, he's still like a, he's just a, you know, just a great two-way player. I mean, you can just look at all his accolades, two times finals MVP, two-time NBA champion, three times, t- three-time All-NBA first team, three-time All-NBA second team, two-time All-NBA defensive player of the year. He's like seven all-defensive teams. He's, uh, he's he's on the NBA 75th anniversary team. So I, I just felt he he edged out Kyrie here on the, for the top pick here. It makes sense. I mean, the Cavs at this time have no one. Like, I think their best player is like a old-ass Antoine Jameson. Um, <laughs> so for me, Kawhi was the pick. Uh, and, you know, who knows what this does to the Cavs roster later as LeBron tries to jump in on this team later. And, you know, maybe if Kawhi's in Cleveland, Zaza never slides in under him and maybe he doesn't have those injury <laughs> concerns. So, you know, I it guess all started from there. I guess that is what started it. That's really what changed the second half of his career. Um, so Kawhi went, originally went 15th overall to um, uh, the Spurs, or sorry, Indianapolis, and he was subsequently traded to the Spurs. Um, he was at San Diego State. And I think the reason why he fell is because of his outside shot. And it just, at the time, was not that impressive. And he worked really hard with uh, the Spurs staff, which is famous for doing that, for helping guys rediscover or discover their, their shooting form and developing their players. So they're probably the best like deve- player development team in the NBA. Yeah, uh, it, it's a, it's kind of a no-brainer. Maybe you lean Jimmy Butler, possibly maybe. Kyrie, yeah. maybe. But I think just aside from the current injury issues, if you just zoom back and you're like, oh, wow, okay, this guy was finals MVP on two teams. He won, you know, a few titles. He he won a, a title as the best player with the Raptors. We can talk about injuries and all that stuff, but whatever. They got it done. He got it done. <laughs> so it's, it, it's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, and he's going to be in the Hall of Fame and all that stuff. It's just crazy to think that the best player in this draft, I mean, we, we, see, we see it a lot. Uh, I wouldn't say every year, but we see it every few years where the best player is picked in the teens or the, the 20s mm-hmm. even. I think Giannis was like the 14th pick in his draft. Uh, Dirk Nowitzki, I think, was like the same thing, 13th, 11th, yep, whatever. Exactly. Yep. And, yeah, he was he, – I mean, these other guys are from Europe. Obviously, he's he's a stateside guy, so it's a little bit of a different situation, but still. Best player in the draft went 15th. So we agreed there. The number two overall pick, this one hurts. I'm wearing an Arizona hat, but it was Derek Williams <laughs> out of Arizona to the Minnesota Timberwolves. Uh, I think he was just a bit of a tweener. Wasn't big enough to play power forward. Wasn't good enough shooter to, to, to play small forward. Maybe he was a guy that was a little bit ahead of his time, but he wasn't, all, he wasn't a great shooter anyway. Anyway. I'm assuming you're not going to stick with him at number two. So who you got at number two here? Definitely not. No, we. Uh, I gave the Jim, uh, the Timberwolves Jimmy Butler. Um, again, 
a team that needs a lot of talent. And Jimmy Butler went pick 30 uh, to the Chicago Bulls in this draft. So, you know, again, another pretty impressive resume for Jimmy Butler here. Six-time All NBA All-Star. He's has one All NBA second team. He has four All NBA third teams. He's made five, I think, NBA All defensive teams. He's won Most Improved. He's been the NBA Steals leader. So, you know, again, this is kind of a team that their best player is Kevin Love, and after that, maybe Ricky Rubio. And so, bring once he brings Jimmy Butler into the fold, and who knows what could have happened with this Timberwolves team? Um, maybe they don't trade Kevin Love here to the Cavs later. And maybe they kind of build with this kind of young core they have with Rubio and Love and, and Butler, and maybe they go places. Mm-hmm. Uh, that would have been an, so an, th- an interesting yeah. trio, those three guys. Yep, absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, no no surprises here. I also had Jimmy Butler. Uh, he was originally the 30th overall pick to the Chicago Bulls out of Marquette. So a pretty somewhat local guy. It's only up in, in I think it's in Milwaukee. Anyway, somewhere it's not somewhere around Chicago. there. <laughs> somewhere in that area. Yeah. Uh, this guy has one of the strangest NBA resumes of all time, of like one of the, the all-time greats. Um, I think it's fair to say he is an all-time great considering his, his playoff performance, but he's a late bloomer. He's, it's similar to Kawhi, where he's drafted primarily for his defense and his hustle and his energy and all that stuff, but he just develops into one of the best two-way players in the league. And for whatever reason, he's a guy that is not an incredible regular season player, But a few years ago, if you're making a list of guys that you would pick to build a team for the playoffs, he's he's on a very short list. He's you know in the top five, I think. You know, even with all the other guys around him, Uh, it's probably changed a little bit now because he's a little bit older. But I do think this would have been an an incredible pick for Minnesota. He ends up on the Timberwolves anyway a few years later, but that was like the Carl Anthony Towns, Andrew Wiggins teams where he just decided you know these guys are soft. (laughs) <laughs> and and he's a psycho and he's like, I can't play with these guys. I need to go play with, with some other psychos. So do you think <laughs> he sticks around there long term? I mean, do you think he always had this crazy fire in him or was this just like a later in his career type thing? I I think he's always kind of had it, right? I think that's what made him so like so successful on the Bulls was he had that fire in him and Dibs would let him play and do his thing. Um I I think he would have stuck around and you know, maybe the tip like like I said, it just depends on how what he thought about Kevin Love. He probably thought Ricky Rubio was soft, but he he probably maybe he thinks Kevin Love is soft. I don't know, um, but you know it just depends on Butler's thoughts on Kevin Love. Do the Timberwolves like trade Kevin Love, right? And then take Carl Anthony Towns. Do they do all that stuff? But I think Butler would have been the leader on this team, and they would have valued his input. Um, and he would have he would have had his choice of players on on the Timberwolves. I think but in choice in terms of who they mm-hmm. draft, uh, probably not free agents because nobody wants to go to Minnesota. Uh, but yeah, so I think I think that probably been something where he sticks around long term and maybe doesn't you know mm-hmm. go through go through all these teams in his career. Yeah, he could have had like a KG type influence because of his his crazy competitiveness and could have taken him from a joke to I mean they made their first Western Conference Finals appearance with KG. Maybe they're able to do that with a, a guy that's again just as competitive in Jimmy Butler. Mm-hmm. So moving on, third overall pick. The Utah Jazz selected Ennis Cantor, Ennis Freedom, or whatever you want to call him, uh, third overall. He technically is a Kentucky player. He never actually played there because of some eligibility issues, but he's coming from Turkey via Kentucky, whatever it is. Uh, who did you have the Jazz taking here? I had the Jazz going Kyrie Irving, so we kind of stopped his. He didn't fall too far here in, in my board. Um, you know, obviously Kyrie is a pretty talented dude he's 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 won an nba championship he's an eight-time all-star he's he's you know he's been on he's been gone in a few all nba nominations i think he's been three in all nba teams he's part of the he had he was once part of the 50 40 90 club i think in 21 he was rookie of the year actually so i mean Kyrie's a pretty talented guy he lived in lebron's shadow for a little bit but um and then katie's shadow for a little bit and then some weird stuff happened with him uh but anyways, that's that's a that could be a whole separate podcast for another day if we look at Kyrie's career. But I think he would have fit well with this uh, the Utah Jazz team, right? He would have been a great fit next to Gordon Hayward. They have Al Jefferson, Paul Millsap, so he kind of gives them that other dynamic scorer who can run the team. And that's what they were kind of missing once they traded Daron Williams out to the Nets, and 
And I think this is actually where the pick comes from because of the Jerome Williams trade. And mm-hmm. they have Devin Harris on the roster, but uh, I think, you know, they they have Kyrie here. They have Gordon Hayward here. They have uh, Paul, a young Paul Millsap here. Uh, could have could have been a pretty decently talented jazz squad. Uh, and maybe Gordon Hayward sticks around. He doesn't, you know, bolt for, uh, where, where did he bolt for? I think Boston at Boston, that time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So maybe he sticks around here with uh with 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 Kyrie, and I, and I think they the Jazz could have had a pretty pretty nice future with those two. Ironically, not me bring up Gordon Hayward. They both went to Boston, I think, the same summer, and Gordon Hayward ends up, you know, basically turning Breaking his foot from... inside out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the first game yeah. of the season, <laughs> within like the first five minutes, uh, one of the nastiest injuries I've ever seen. Uh, so I'm gonna differ from you here, actually. Uh, okay. I'm surprised. Uh, I actually went Clay Thompson. So Clay originally went 11th, of course, to the Warriors out of Washington State. And I think if we had this draft a year ago, I think we're both definitely taking Clay here, given the way yeah. Kyrie's career was on the downturn. Um, I don't think many people thought he was going to get back to the conference finals, get back to the finals. People probably didn't think he was going to be a contributor on a winning team anymore. So anyway, the reason I took Clay is because of the durability. I think Kyrie obviously has a higher ceiling. I think he's one of the most talented players in the NBA, but I think there's a lot of volatility with him, both personality wise uh, and uh, injury wise, of course, and health wise. So, I mean, I think from, uh, so I looked this up between their second and seventh year, because you kind of throw the rookie year out of the window because it's more, you know, developmental, whatever. You're not playing much. You're not starting much from their second to the seventh year. Uh, Clay averaged 78 games a year. Kyrie averaged 65 games a year. And there was a long stretch where even if Kyrie was healthy, during the playoff run, he would get hurt. He got hurt uh, in in uh, Boston. He, I think he like had a no- nasal fracture or something like that. He got hurt in Brooklyn where he, I think it was an ankle. So he was out that series. It's just there's a long history, of, of course, with the Cavs, I think twice, at least once or twice. twice. Definitely missed Where, the, the first NBA Finals. Yeah, so I think in terms of like the ceiling, as I said, the peak, Kyrie is better than Clay. But I think in terms of stability, durability, longevity, I mean, Clay just he had those injuries starting in 2019. But before that, he was a, he was a trooper. He never missed any games. He was always healthy in the playoffs. He had some huge playoff moments, as we know. You know, Game Six, Clay was was a thing for a reason. Yep. Obviously, Kyrie is the same type of dude. He's he's super clutch, and he's still making plays. But I think just for that stability, I'm going to take Clay over Kyrie. Am I crazy? No, 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 no. I'm. It was a debate for me too. I was, I was thinking Kyrie, Clay, Kyrie, Clay. I was like, man, who do I go with? And I was like, I'll go Kyrie just because I feel like he would have given the Jazz that point guard that they were missing. That's that's that was my thought process. Yeah, you didn't like Devin Harris. Nah, I don't like that. <laughs> Scrub. I liked him. He's fast. I was just fast. That was it. But whatever. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next up, the fourth overall pick. So the Cleveland Cavaliers had two picks in the top four, and they selected power forward center Tristan Thompson out of Texas. So, who did you have them taking fourth overall? Yeah, this is this is where I went with Clay Thompson. Um, I, so. Didn't, didn't have him sliding too far down here. Again, right? We talked about Clay. He's he's a four time NBA champ. He's five time All Star. He's two time All NBA third team. He's been on the All Defensive team, right? Uh, so, can you imagine this scenario right now? The Cavs got Clay and Kawhi, and what a, what a combination that would have been. Um, Yuck! Between those Yuck. two, <laughs> Yuck! Oh, I hate man. that. Been... No, no, I mean, I love it for oh. Cleveland. I hate it for, oh, yeah, yeah. for me personally yeah, as for the a re- fan. Yeah, for the, re- for the rest of the NBA, I hate it too, right? Like as a Warriors fan, I'm like, damn, I, could, I couldn't imagine Clay on the Cavs, right? That'd be horrendous. But hey, if the Cavs had a chance to take Kawhi and Clay, my goodness, they don't even need LeBron to come back. They'd be like, nah, LeBron, keep your ass in Miami. Um, Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. So, so that's, I mean, Clay for me was either the third or fourth best player here. So mm-hmm. we have to, have to take him here. Um, and, and we just talked about Clay and all his accomplishments and his longevity. So pair him with Kawhi and my God, NBA, that's like, that's like an NBA, any NBA team's worst nightmare having those two guys on the same team. Yuck. Like I said, <laughs> <laughs> for us as a, I'm a Cavs hater. It's okay. Um, 
so this is where I pick Kyrie. No surprise here. Um, he still ends up on Cleveland. He's still um, a Cavalier for the start of his career. Um, maybe things go a little bit differently when he doesn't have the number one pick expectations. I don't know. Um, but obviously he proved he can be the number two on a title winning team. He's proving it again, you know, that he can be the number two on a, um, a finals team at least. And I think his legacy ultimately is going to be, this guy is one of the best Robins in, in the history of the NBA. Just when he's paired with the right guy, when he's mentally right, when he's physically right, it's, it's hard to find a better player um, in the NBA than him. So number five, the Toronto Raptors selected center Jonas Valanciunas out of Lithuania. Who did you have the Raptors picking here fifth overall? I still have them going with the center, just a different one. I, I went with Nikola Vucevic, who I believe went to pick 16 to Philly and then got traded to the Magic, I think, something like that. Um, but Vucevic, uh, I mean, he's a pretty good, pretty skilled big man, right? Uh, is like If you look at his career averages, he his career averages is a double-double. He's 17 points and 10.5 and rebounds, so... He's a he's a guy who I think would have came in would have fit into with the Raptors, um, giving them a little bit of an offensive punch, which they were they had hoped uh, on Andre Bergnani would have given them, which he didn't. Um, and then you know he eventually would have paired up with DeRozan and Lowry, and that would have been a pretty good uh, offensive team there. Vucevic a little bit of a defensive liability, but again he can provide the scoring and rebounding that they need on the offensive end, and so I thought he was a good fit here for the Raptors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had I had them going the same same direction. Um, so like you said, he went 16th overall to Philly uh, out of USC. He ends up getting traded a year later in the Dwight three team deal. Oh, okay, basically. that's what it was. Okay, yes. Yeah, I feel like Philly was uh, basically trying to get Andrew Bynum, which was an absolute disaster. So Dwight <laughs> goes to LA, um, Bynum goes to Philly, and a bunch of other guys go to Orlando. They got like you know obviously Vucevic and like three other picks. So it was just a, a huge. Like a, a terrible trade for Philly, a huge overpay for Andrew Bynum when they could have just gotten, they could have just stuck with Vucevic and he would have been a great mm-hmm. player. I almost forgot that he was actually in Philly because he didn't play that much that, his, his rookie year. Exactly. That's what, I forgot about him in Philly. I was like, I think he got traded to the Magic like right after his, like after the draft. That's what I thought. <laughs> but apparently yeah, he was that, there that for was a year. That's what I thought too. But then I actually, I also had like a mental image of him in a Sixers jersey where I think he wore number 20. But, yeah, it obviously wasn't wasn't there for very long. It was a dark dark time in Philadelphia. Uh, this was like the start of the process. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, he's an offensively skilled big man. I think he was overlooked in Orlando just because it's Orlando. They weren't very good. But I mean, I hate to use fantasy as a reference point, but I think I had him as in his, either his second year or in Orlando or his third, and he was just putting up like regularly. He'd have you know twenty five and twenty type nights. Yep. Uh, mm-hmm. just a rebounding monster. I get why Chicago paid uh, him what they paid him or, or traded all those assets to get him. Um, I think he's he's even the three-point shooter at this point, you know, mm-hmm. as you said, a decent clip. So he's evolved with the league, which is great for him. And I think it's just kind of a bummer that he's ended up on a bunch of bad teams because uh, yeah, I think he deserves better. But I, And I think in Toronto, it would have been a great combination with him and DeRozan. DeRozan was already there. They hadn't gotten Lowry yet, but Yep, that trio, you know, yeah. maybe he's a Marcus All type uh, influence for them, which obviously helped them win the title along with with Kawhi, of course. But yeah, uh, I guess we're we're back on the same page here. <laughs> so uh, sixth overall, the Washington Wizards select Jan Vasili out of the Czech Republic. I think he's Serbian too. Uh, one of those guys. Um, who did you have the Wizards taking sixth overall here? Based on a talent standpoint i wanted to go kemba walker but the wizards had john wall so i went tobias harris who i believe went pick 19 here in this draft um and i think he went to the bucks and so tobias harris i think he would have been a good fit with john wall uh they were starting i think trevor booker and andre blosh and tobias harris would have been an upgrade over them Again, not a amazing shooter, but he's a guy who could get some buckets. I, I think if you look at his kind of prime years, I think Tobias Harris averages like twenty points per game, seven rebounds, three assists. So I think he would have he would fit in here. He's a okay defender. Uh, lately, not a great defender, but in his prime, he was a okay defender. But again, he's a guy who could get some buckets, kind of in that Josh Smith mold, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and he would have been a good fit here with Washington with John Wall, and he could have ran, ran the floor here with John Wall. If Tobias Harris had Josh Smith's uh, confidence, I think he would be a much, <laughs> much better player. I think we would Absolutely. be having different conversations about him. Um, I was saving this for when I picked Tobias Harris, but Tobias Harris to me is he's uh, sparkling water. You know what I'm saying? He does okay. the job. Like if you're if you're sitting down, it's kind of it's hot outside, or you're having a meal. You're like, you know, I don't really want to drink a soda, but I need some bubbles, some carbonation. So I'm gonna drink this sparkling water, this Lacroix or Waterloo or whatever. You take a sip, and you're like, you know what? I'm kind of missing something here. <laughs> You know, it's kind of doing the job for me. It's it's doing what I hoped it would do, but it's it's not the same as a as a ice cold soda. So I I ended up going with uh, Kemba Walker. Sorry, not Kemba Walker. I ended up going with Jonas Valanciunas instead. Um, I also considered Kemba Walker, but like you said, they had just drafted John Wall the year before, so they're not going to double up on point guards. They had not drafted Bradley Beal yet. So maybe a backcourt of John Wall and Kemba Walker would have worked, but I think it would have been a would've defensive been. liability. But exactly. I mean, it's not, it's exactly. not like Bradley Beal's a great defender anyway. So for the reasons that you talked about, they're they're missing. They don't have any real talent in the front court. I think JaVale McGee was their starting center, but they traded him later that year anyway to Denver. So I think they were done with the JaVale experiment. And I think Jonas just makes sense here as as a starting center. And they could have, you know, could have been fun. Him and uh, John Wall could have been running that that pick and roll all day. So, yeah, yeah, no, makes sense. Um, I, I had Valencia, and it's a little bit lower on my draft, but we'll get there. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, next up, this was a, a surprise pick. Looking back, I didn't realize he went this high, but uh, seventh <laughs> yeah. overall, the Sacramento Kings selected Bismack Biombo. Um, he's originally from Congo, but was playing in Spain at the time. Um, he ends up getting traded uh, by the Kings in order for them to get the the rights to John Salmons and the tenth overall pick. But basically, he went seventh overall. So, who did you have the uh, Kings picking here instead? This is where I went with Kemba Walker. I mean, Kemba in his prime, pretty talented guy. He he only goes like two picks later here in this draft, anyways, to the Bobcats at nine. Um, I mean, Kemba's four-time All-Star. He's he's has one All-NBA third team, and I think he would have been a, a dynamic playmaker next to Tyreek Evans. Uh, I mean, in, in his prime, Kemba's one of the quickest guards in the NBA. And if you even look at his just like overall career stats, he finishes with like nineteen point three points, five point three assists, and if you look at some of his best, one of his best seasons, Kemba has twenty five point six points per game and six assists. So that's I think that's where he gets his All-NBA third team. Um, so yeah, he's a dynamic guard. He's he's he could pair well with uh, a bigger Tyreek Evans. Maybe there's some defensive concerns there between that duo, but he's uh he's a pretty pretty good player. And if you look at his uh, warp score uh, on Basketball Reference, he's actually number four in this draft after Kawhi, Jimmy, and Kyrie. So uh, definitely provides some value there. Yeah, that that helped me make some decisions. Some when I was deciding between two guys, the the value over replacement player, along with the uh, win shares. You can't use the win shares per 48 because there's some random dudes up there. Yeah, you're um, like, where, where did this guy come from? Yeah, right. It's like the 45th overall pick just up there. Um, or the, I think, box score plus minus is a little bit deceiving too just because it can be a small sample size. Anyway, I took Kemba for a lot of the same reasons that you mentioned. Dynamic point guard. He can score. Uh, Boogie Cousins was already on this team. So I think of the trio of... Uh, Boogie and Tyreek and uh, Kemba. I know Tyreek was the rookie of the year. It was the year before or maybe two years before. Mm-hmm. Um, I know he fell off a little bit race, a little later in his career. I think he had some substance issues. I think so. Am I, am I remembering that right? Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. He had a cocaine problem. There you go. So maybe that was caused by the fact that they never made the playoffs in Sacramento. So I think uh, <laughs> that was mean. Anyway, I think if you bring if you bring Kemba to sack and you have this trio of Tyreek, Kemba, and and Cousins, I think that's an incredible offensive unit. Then you add some of the other guys around there. Basically, they were looking for a point guard. They thought it was going to be Jimmer. Obviously, that didn't work out. So they get a guy that is 10 times the player, at least even in college too, shit. Uh, but 10 times the player that, that Jimmer was. And I think he adds a real scoring punch to, to a team, a lot of excitement, I think to the team It would have been really fun to watch. Um, 100%. Next 
the Detroit Pistons went eighth overall. They drafted Brandon Knight out of Kentucky. Who did you have the Pistons taking here? I went with uh, maybe the shocks you call it, maybe it doesn't. I went with Isaiah Thomas, uh, who was the last pick of this draft in, in pick 60. But I, I, Isaiah Thomas, I think, would have been a good fit here for the, the Pistons. Uh, I mean, one, he has the same name as the original Isaiah Thomas. But Isaiah Thomas, it's a bit uh, confusing, but yeah, a bit confused. It would have confused maybe some Pistons fans. Maybe maybe you could have worn the same number. People could have reused that Isaiah Thomas jersey. Uh, but surprisingly, Isaiah Thomas has a All NBA second team. I didn't I didn't remember that. He's a two time All Star. He made the rookie second team as well. So he was a pretty good player. Um, pretty dynamic guy. I think. Obviously, he's on the shorter end. I think he's like under five ten. Um. But I think Detroit needed a point guard, and he would have been a good fit there. He was he had a career averages of seventeen point four points per game, four point eight assists. Um, in the 2016-2017 season, where he gets that second team All NBA, he's these numbers are pretty spectacular. He's averaging twenty eight point nine points per game and five point nine assists per game while shooting forty six percent from the field and thirty eight percent from the the three point shot uh three point land. So, you know, he would have paired here with Rodney Stuckey, Greg Monroe kind of given the Pistons some decent pieces to build around and he would, could have been a possible point guard for the future here for Detroit. Mm-hmm. And obviously they have an aging Tayshaun Prince as well, but um, kind of yeah. build in for the future. And Ben Wallace was on this team too. I think they had some of yeah. the uh, like vestiges of that 04 team still hanging around. Um, and I, so I, I get the IT pick. I, I, I will talk about him a little bit later because I have him coming up very soon. Um, I went Tobias Harris instead. Um, I know I just talked about him being, you know, sparkling water, um, where he just leaves you wanting a little bit more. I know he ends up on Detroit anyway. Um, he ends up, he was picked uh, 19th overall by, by Charlotte. He ends up getting traded to Milwaukee and he's been on, I don't know, five, six teams at this point. Um, uh, I just think he's a good player. He's a good regular season player. I think he's he's able to shine when he's on the ball more. I think he's been kind of miscast in Philadelphia. I think he's been basically shoved into the corner as like the third or fourth option, even when they had the James Harden team. So, but I do think his mentality is, is a big part of it because he's, he's too passive and he's willing to do all that. But I do think he does have all the tools. He's a, uh, he's a big wing. He can guard, you know, just about anybody one through five. I think he's, Everything that, that, like on paper, this guy should be one of the best players in the league. But there's just a little bit something missing. Maybe if he goes to to Detroit, maybe his career turns out a little bit differently when he's not being shipped around constantly. He's able to, to kind of build his identity in one place. I don't know. Maybe I'm giving him too much credit, but I, just, I do <laughs> think he's he's too big, too talented to uh, uh, not end up here or not you know to slide a little bit further than this. So, yep, fair. All right. Speaking of Kemba, so ninth overall, the I think it's the Hornets at the time. I don't know if they were the Bobcats, Bob, whatever they were. They were the Bobcats at the time. <laughs> they were still the Bobcats. I think okay. they become the Hornets like three, four years later. Yeah. All right. The Charlotte somethings. Uh, ninth <laughs> overall, they picked Kemba Walker out of UConn. So he's not on the board for either of us anymore. Uh, so who did you have the Bobcats picking ninth? Yeah, this is where I went with uh, Jonas Valanciunas. Um, he, obviously, we talked about him. He went and picked pick number five. But uh, I think, yeah, they needed a center, and Jonas is the best available player at this point and best available center at this point. Obviously, a guy who's, you know, I think he's had, his career averages are 13.4 points per game, 9.5 rebounds per game, one block a game. So, you know, he's he's a he's a formidable player. In, in one of his best seasons, he averaged, like, I think, 20 points per game and almost 11 rebounds and one and a half blocks. So, you know, he would have been a great upgrade for them. Um, I think at this point in their at time, the, they had Byron Mullins at center. Um, so obviously a huge upgrade and just a, a piece for this uh, Hornet Bobcats team or Hornets team, whatever you want to call them, uh, to start building around and eventually make, did they make the playoffs? As I forget. At some point, they did, at some point they didn't make the playoffs once as a yeah. play-in team or something like that. But this is pre. It's pre just play-in. another piece for them to have. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like they were always like b- before the play, and they were always the eight seed, and they'd lose in five in the first round every yeah, time. Something like uh, that, right? Yeah. <laughs> during the Kemba era, that was their their ceiling. Uh, so Jonas is already off the board for me. I, I think I think a little bit highly more highly of him than you do. 
question for you. How much did you take into account uh, the fact that some of these guys are still playing? Like some of these guys are not. So did you take that into account? The fact that they I, showed I some did. longevity? Yeah. I did take that into account, especially in some of these later picks. Um, I Yeah, definitely. There, the there are a couple picks. of guys where I was like, I want to take them, but I'm like, mm, should I? And then shouldn't I? And then I was like, well, I, and we'll, we'll get into it. We'll get into it. Some yeah, of these guys, we'll, you'll see we'll get them. To it. No, no spoilers. Um, so I had uh, the Hornets or Bobcats, whatever. I keep it. <laughs> <I> keep <messing laughs> Let's call them the stuff. Hornets, whatever. They're the Hornets now. I will call them Charlotte. Uh, yeah, the Charlotte Hornets. I had them taking Isaiah Thomas here. Um, this is kind of a theme, but I'm like, is is he just a discount Kemba Walker? Is he like a because I know pretty much. Yeah, like his his peak. I think he was better than Kemba that that one season where he took the Celtics to the conference finals. Uh, but he seemed to figure something out at that point, and I, it's really unfortunate because I do think he might have ended up with a better career than Kemba, but that hip injury where you know boss the Boston media or not media the medical staff. I I don't know if they lied to him per se, but they kind of told him you can't injure this any worse and then it ends up getting much worse and he gets i think he gets a hip replacement in his in his late yeah, 20s something like something that yeah real real crazy shit so i think without that hip injury without the celtics ruining his career basically um and they didn't force him to play you can't force anybody to do anything but they could have shut him down and just brought him back the next year they end up trading him while he's hurt and then his career has just kind of been derailed since then but I do think if he doesn't have that hip injury, then I think he ends up being uh, the better player than than Kemba. All right. Really? Oh, wow. Okay, wow. Yeah. Okay, 10th right. overall, the Milwaukee Bucks, technically, uh, selected Jimmer Fredette out of BYU. They ended up trading this pick. It's a bunch of trades, and Jimmer ends up going to uh, Sacramento, which is uh, unfortunate given who was picked next <laughs> in this draft. Uh, but who did you have the Bucks taking uh, definitely instead of Jimmer Fredette? Yeah, this and this is kind of where you, we were talking about, you know, guys still playing, still in the league. And I went with Bojan Bogdanovic, who I think in this draft he goes pick 31. Um, and it's kind of interesting because he, he did get drafted in 2011, but he doesn't come over until 2014. Uh, and he comes over with the Nets and he be, he's an all rookie second team player. But I think Bojan would have been a good pick here. Um, he averages like 15.6 points per game in his career. He's a plus defender. And he has one of his better seasons with the Jazz um, where he averaged 20.2 points per game while shooting 41% from three-point range. on, And that's like on seven attempts a game. So that's pretty impressive. Uh, I think he's kind of the perfect 3 and D guy that the Bucks would eventually need once they draft Giannis and all, and he could have contributed for the team. And he probably comes over around the same time as Giannis and they kind of develop together. So I thought, you know, a good shooter, good defender. Um, it's kind of slim pickings as we get towards the end of this lotto here. Um, so, and I fig- and and I factored in that he's still playing right now, and he mm-hmm. still was a, a significant contributor for the Knicks. I would say not not significant, but a good contributor for the Knicks. Um, yeah, before he got hurt. Before he got hurt. Yep, exactly. So that factored into me taking him here. For sure, um, I went in a slightly different direction. Speaking of guys that are still playing, um, I picked. Uh, Reggie Jackson. So he went uh, 24th overall in this draft to the the Thunder out of Boston College. Basically was just a six man for a few years um, in uh, in OKC. I think him and Westbrook uh, kind of butted heads a lot. And he was it, it, it was a good indicator of the type of dude that he is. He's a real irrational confidence type guy. Uh, <laughs> I think he's got a lot of heart. Um, and I like that about him. Um, He's had his best seasons of his career when he was a full-time starter in Detroit. Um, since then, he's kind of bounced around a little bit. He was on the Clippers. Now he's on the Nuggets. He was a, a pretty decent part of that, um, the 2023 uh, championship team. So I give him credit for that. And I, I think that, again, for the reason that, that he's still around, he's still playing. Again, we're dealing with some slim pickings here um, yeah. at this point. but. I also considered Boyan, but I, I give Reggie Jackson the, the slight edge here. All right. Okay. Next up, our boy, 11th overall, the Golden State Warriors select Clay Thompson out of Washington State. He's uh, off the board here. Uh, both of us have already picked him, of course. 
So who did you have the Warriors taking instead? This is where I went with Reggie Jackson. So not too far behind you here, call it. Um, again, all the things you said about Reggie Jackson, right? Still playing in the league. I had pretty pretty good seasons in Detroit where he's like, where he drops, I think, 18 and a half, 18.8 points per game, 6.2 assists. So I think he could have kind of stepped into that bench player role behind Steph Curry. He could have been kind of that six-man bridge until they get guys like Sean Livingston, Iguodala, uh, before they start their title run, maybe he gets traded for one of those guys or some, something like that. Maybe he gets traded for Iguodala eventually. But again, could have been a solid bench guy. Um, major downgrade for the Warriors if they end up taking Reggie Jackson because Clay Thompson was gone. But again, they they would get a solid bench guy out of Reggie Jackson. And again, like you said, he was a contributing player for the Nuggets title run. And, you know, it's been a good, good solid overall player who's uh, still in the league playing. I don't think he would have been a bench guy for the Warriors at this point in the at Warriors. This point, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, eventually, yeah. eventually, yeah. Eventually. Maybe, like, yeah, he would have eventually. Probably for the Warriors for the for for the first three years, probably like with Steph Curry being hurt and yeah. things like that. I want to say like Jarrett Jack was starting for the Warriors in like 2011, 2012. So that was their uh, that was their tank for Harrison Barnes season, right? Like the yeah. next year. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Like, so I think they were playing Reggie. heavy clip minutes with Clay. Like I think Clay was like at the towards the end of it. I went. I remember going to a game. Uh, it was a Spurs game, and like they were just letting Clay jack up shot after shot after shot. Like I think he took like fifty didn't shots that game or something. <laughs> it didn't even and they lost by fifty, but Clay was just shooting up shots. They were like, "Hey, get it in." He probably liked that more than winning the title. He's like, "Yeah, just let me shoot yeah, all probably. day." Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I already had Reggie Jackson off the board, so I went actually with Boyan. I thought again, just like Isaiah Thomas is a discount, Kemba Walker. I feel like Bogdanovich is a discount, Clay Thompson. Uh, Again, you mentioned he had a kind of a weird start to his career. He got traded twice um, after the draft, went 31st overall to Miami, starts with the Nets. Um, but I think, like you said, there was a few years where he was averaging 20 points per game or close to it. I think he's a really good scorer. Um, he's a career 39.5% three-point shooter. So like you said, 3 and D can stretch the floor. Bigger dude can guard bigger guys. He's obviously not the defender that Clay is. He's not the shooter that Clay is. but if you're looking for some of the same characteristics, like a bigger, you know, a bigger guy, he's not a two guard either, but a bigger guy to put next to Steph Curry that can still stretch the floor. Uh, I think this would have been um, a good pick and he's a very capable offensive player and always has been. I think he's still going to contribute to, uh, to a, a good team next year. If he's still on the Knicks. Um, 100%. Yeah. So, I think we agreed there. At least we just flip flopped uh, the picks. Yep. So, 12th overall, the Utah Jazz selected Alec Burks out of Colorado. Who did you have the Jazz picking here? So I, I ended up taking Enos Cantor here. I gave him I gave him back to the Jazz. <laughs> um, again, a guy they took at three. Cantor for his career averages about 11.2 points per game and 7.8 rebounds per game. Uh, I think he plays about give or take 10 seasons here in the NBA. Um, I think one of his best seasons, he's a double-double guy where he has like 14 points, 11 rebounds. So I, I think maybe it takes less pressure off him being picked like later in the lottery. He maybe gels a little bit better with this team. They have Ky like in my world, they have Kyrie, Gordon Hayward. And so he doesn't, have, it's not so much as put on his shoulders and Paul Millsap's running and eventually he paces Al Jefferson. And who knows, who knows, who knows, maybe, Maybe the Jazz don't end up taking Rudy Gobert down the line and hampering his career a little bit. But I think, you know, at this point, you're just hoping for a decent bench guy, and that's what Cantor was and always has been. Um, and you wouldn't expect more than that. So I think, you know, getting a center here who could, you know, back up uh, Al Jefferson was probably key for the Jazz here. Mm -hmm. I had the same exact thought process. Um, I <laughs> went with Ennis Freedom, Ennis Cantor, whatever the hell. Uh, I'm not calling he, him freedom, man. He's, yeah. he's a canter. <laughs> In my notes here, I said a really deeply unlikable guy, but he was a good player on offense. <laughs> and that's what I think of him. Um, he was always corny, um, always, you know, he, his beef, quote unquote, beef with LeBron when he was on the Knicks was annoying. Everything about him is just really annoying. He's a very annoying personality, but he's a very good offensive player. He's a good rebounder. He could score with the best of them. He had, you know, a good post game. He could shoot a little bit from the mid range. So, I I like him as an offensive player. He was very, very limited on defense. I think maybe his foot speed, maybe his his mentality, whatever it is, super one dimensional guy. But 
that's okay. I think at this point in the draft, you're okay with a one dimensional guy that at least can give you, you know, 15 and 10 or whatever, um, off the bench. So mm-hmm. yep. again, you're, you're happy with that at this point. All right. Next, the 13th overall pick, the Phoenix Suns selected Markeith Morris out of Kansas. So who did you have the Suns drafting here? Yeah, th- at this point, we're we're pretty slim pickings, but I went with a guy who, who flashed a lot of potential uh, early on in his career, and that was Kenneth Farid. Uh, he went pick 22, I believe, to the Nuggets. And then, he, you know, he, he, was, he was he had a pretty good rookie year. He was on that all-rookie first team. Um, again, a guy full of full of potential, but injuries limit him to just seven NBA seasons. When I think when he when healthy, you know, you could see that hustle and energy. He's a high energy guy. Uh, for his career, he has eleven point four points per game, eight point one rebounds per game. In one of his better seasons, uh, one of his more prime seasons, he's at thirteen point eight points per game and eight point six rebounds and one steal, one block. And that's on and he's not playing thirty minutes. He's he's playing under thirty minutes. I think he's averaging like twenty six, twenty seven for. For that season and so you know if you translate that to like 36 you know it's, it's much better numbers where it's like something like 18 points 11 rebounds and you know one and a half steals one and a half blocks so again a guy who who just gave all out effort um obviously was not playing full 30 minutes a game like he was he was more of a bench guy and i think you know based on that potential probably something the suns needed at that point in time just uh just a guy who could come in and hustle and and kind of you know give them effort and that's what kenneth reed was mm-hmm. yeah seven I think if he didn't have those injury concerns, maybe we were talking about him in a slightly different light. Maybe he's a little higher on this board, but again, injuries limit him, and he's yeah, he's maybe an honorable mention for you, call it. I don't know where you, where you stand on him, but I, I feel like I've always been a little higher on Kenneth Reed than most people, but I like his energy and hustle. I, I like him as a person. Um, I, I do like that type of player. Um, I do feel like they're kind of a dime a dozen. The tweener big that's just working hard, that, that – is a guy that's going to be like diving for loose balls and all that stuff. Like, I think you can find that pretty easily. Um, it's interesting that you use the, the per 36 for him because I use the per 36 to justify my draft pick. Um, <laughs> and that is Nikola Miritich. Uh, so 13th overall, he was uh, 23rd overall. He went 23rd overall, I should say to the bulls. Um, he's Serbian, but he played for the Spanish national team. So, but he's ethnically Serbian. Uh, but he was playing for Real Madrid at the time, um, which of course is the the best club in, or one of the best clubs in Europe. So he didn't end up coming to the NBA until 2014, just like Bogdanovich. But I thought he was very much like a modern stretch big. Um, so maybe he's a little bit ahead of his time. Uh, but he shoots the three at a decent clip. He's like 36% from his career or for his career. He hasn't been in the NBA since I think 2018, but a lot of that had to do with getting punched in the face by Bobby Portis because uh, he got, you know, they were on the bulls together and he got punched in the that's, face and, you know, I think it's a good reason, I remember right? him for, by the way. Yeah. That's I the only know, reason I, I remember Miritich. Poor guy. Right. But I mean, he ends up playing a couple of years uh, after the punch, but I think the uh, payday in Europe, he ended up being, you know, Europe's high, highest paid player for Barcelona. He, you know, goes and balls out there, wins a, a year, a Euro title. So I think he made the right decision to be a big fish in a small pond versus a bench guy um, out, out out here. But I still think he's the type of guy that teams would love to have, especially coming off the bench. He's, again, that that stretch big that can spread the floor. He can shoot the three. He's a good passer, just a skilled offensive player that I think, again, may have been a little bit ahead of his time. Um, but, yeah, he just needed to get away from Bobby Portis. So I, I completely understand the decision. Um <laughs> All right, the last pick in the lottery, uh, 14th overall, the Houston Rockets selected Marcus Morris out of Kansas. So Markeef and Marcus go back to back. Who did you have the Rockets picking here? I went ahead and went with Chandler Parsons, who was a second round pick, uh, pick 38 here. Um, Parsons, another guy whose career was cut short due to injuries. He only plays nine seasons. Uh, he averages 12.7 points per game, 4.5 rebounds, and about three assists and one steal for his career. In one of his better seasons, which was ironically with the Rockets, I believe, um, he gets 6.6 points per game, 5.5 rebounds, four assists, in about 37 minutes a game. So overall, Parsons is, was kind of the guy who could give you a little bit of everything, some rebounding, some, some shooting, some scoring, some assists. Uh, and I think, you know, maybe, maybe he's a little bit higher on this list if he manages to play longer in the NBA and has a, 
not not such an injury riddled uh, last few years in the NBA. But I think you know again just another good solid overall guy who could have been uh, a bench a, a, a six man or a bench guy on on the right team mm-hmm. and maybe a third or fourth option on the right team. Uh, so that's that's my last pick here, Colin. Yeah, I, I considered him, um, but similar to Ken Fareed, just the same thing. The injuries just. There's guys that have been playing for a long time and are still playing. Um, and that's why I went with Marcus Morris. So I stuck with the same pick. Uh, he uh, ends up being him. yeah, he ends up being a slightly better player than his older brother. I, I guess they're identical. Well, I don't know who's older. Yeah. They're <laughs> but, they're they're like they're twins. They're twins. Yeah. Marquis yeah, is technically older by like five minutes or whatever. Yeah. But they are, you know, identical twins and they um have the same tattoos. So I think Marcus is a little bit lighter. He's like listed at like 20 pounds lighter than him. So maybe that's the only way we can tell them apart. Um, but basically, you know, he's, he's a decent player. Um, he shoots a three at a, at a again, a decent clip. Um, there's moments where he might look like the best player on the floor, but if you stretch that out over a game, you're just not winning anything if you're relying on him, but he is an irrational confidence guy. And that's kind of what you want um, out of your bench players. I do think he's a good rotational player. And I was surprised to see that he has 11 playoff games with over 20 points. So he can score. He can oh, always wow. score. He can um, score. And has played in 76 career playoff games. So, you know, he's been around. Uh, he's bad. played on a lot of teams. I think it's like eight teams. Uh, but he's still around. He just scored 25 points for the Cavs in game five against <laughs> the Celtics. So he's he's still doing it. Yeah, he's uh, on the Cavs. I don't even remember that. I don't even – I don't. I, I, I thought he left the NBA by now. <laughs> No, no, man. He's still, I mean, it took like four other guys to get hurt for him to play, but they threw him out there and he scored 25 points uh, against the Celtics. It was a blowout, but hey, he could still score. Yeah. Um, So my honorable mentions, I'll start. I had, you know, again, Kenneth Freed and um, Chandler Parsons. So, but I couldn't draft them because of the injuries. Also, Markeith Morris. I think he was, I was debating between him and his brother, but he's a slightly worse player. And then Bismack Biombo, who's still in the NBA, super limited guy, but oh, he's again oh, like a surprised. yeah, just honorable mention. I didn't, I didn't have him. I just, I thought about it, but I didn't. He wasn't even on. It. He wasn't even on my honorable mentions. Yeah. So who who are your honorable mentions? Here? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I, I Alec Burks actually was one of the guys I had on here. I had Miritich, Marcus Morris, Markeith Morris. Um, I had Shumpert, Iman Imam Shumpert. He had a solid, yeah, decent run here with the Cavs and the Knicks. Um, and then. I kind of felt like Brendan Knight could have been kind of the guy there. Uh, he had a few moments in his career where he kind of could have been a guy. Um, so he was in my honorable mentions. Bismarck Viambo, he can he stay on the bench. Don't give a <laughs> shit about him. Um, what right, would it I'll, even take him yeah. if I had a top twenty pick? <laughs> <laughs> That's totally fair. I don't I don't blame you. Um, all solid choices. Yeah, I, th- I thought about Alec Burks and Iman Shumpert as well, but. Um, anyway, so that that's it for our redraft. Um, we'll see who wins in the NBA Finals because I think that's going to uh, influence who we do the next redraft, whether it's the Luka draft, the Jalen Brown draft, the Kyrie – or not Kyrie, the uh, Jason Tatum draft, maybe the Al Horford one because we got plenty of content coming for you oh, guys man. this summer. We'll take it way back, yep. uh, way, way back. Uh, but this was do a lot it. of fun. Appreciate you, man. Uh, thank you guys for checking us out. Make sure to uh, hit that subscribe button and leave us a review wherever you're listening or watching to this podcast. And make sure to follow us on all the major platforms at 4040 Vision Pod. Thanks, y'all.